prove that if the points in a convergence sequence are reordered, then the new sequence converges to the same limit. Okay, so our plan of action for this proof is we're going to first investigate and play around with an example and, and develop some conclusions about the patterns that we see. And then second, we're going to develop some notation so that we can more clearly talk about those conclusions and more carefully write out and formalize those conclusions that we made in our investigation. And then three, we're going to solidify and make clear what it is that we want to show. And then fourth, we're going to make a claim based off of our investigations that we, we developed in part one here. And then five, we're going to prove that claim that we made in part four. Okay, so let's start out with an example of a convergence sequence, uh, maybe a convergence sequence that's easy to deal with and that we're all familiar with. One, one half, one third, one fourth, and so on. And let's take one possible reordering of this convergence sequence. So say one over a million. And then maybe the next term would be one over 297. And then maybe one over 17, and so on. And eventually, somewhere down, along down the line, we'd, we'd, we'd reach one. And then later we'd reach one half, and then later we'd reach maybe, well, not, not maybe, for sure, we would reach eventually one fourth, and then eventually we'd reach our one third, and this would continue on forever. So, in order to bring your attention to the pattern that's evident in this, and that it's not, not, might not be evident at first, but after playing around with a bunch of examples and a bunch of reorderings of this particular convergence sequence, an example that comes up or excuse me, uh, the pattern that comes up is, is best seen when we kind of fall back on our definition of a convergence sequence. So remember, a sequence A1, A2, A3, and so on, converges to A if, given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists a positive integer capital N such that all terms that come after A sub capital N all of these terms to the right of A sub capital N are a distance away from A, the value to which this sequence converges, less than epsilon. So one thing to notice in this definition is that our epsilon dictates what our N value is. That is to say that N is a function of epsilon or N is dependent on the choice of epsilon. So let's say for this particular sequence that we have an epsilon strictly greater than zero such that our N value, the N value that works, the N value that works for this particular epsilon is say n equals 4. So that means our n is right here. Our n is right here. So, check this out. If I were a traveler along this newly reordered sequence, if I were traveling term by term along this newly reordered sequence, and I, I got to the first term, I got to 1 over 1 million, and then I traveled along to 1 over 297, and I kept going, and I came across my 1 here. And then I came across, eventually I kept going, and eventually I came across a one-half. And then I kept going, and I came across one-fourth. And then I kept going, and I came across one-third. And after a bunch of times playing around with different reorderings of this sequence, and, and imagining yourself as a traveler along this sequence going term by term, you'd notice that, hey, I'm always going to pass up the following. I'm always going to pass up. I'm gonna, it's so, this is so important that I'm going to write this down. I'm always going to pass up the final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. There was always going to be a term there's always going to be the last term that we come across if we were traveling along the sequence whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. So check this out. This one third here is the final term whose index, this is the final term that we're going to come across as a traveler along the sequence whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. In this case, less than or equal to 4. And check this out. Every term after one third every term after one-third in this newly reordered sequence is going to be a distance away from zero, which is the value to which this sequence converges. This sequence converges to zero. And every term after one-third in this newly reordered sequence, this, this reordering of this particular sequence, every term one af after one-third is going to be a distance away from zero less than epsilon for this particular epsilon value. 
Just like in the original sequence, every term after one-fourth, every term that came after one-fourth is going to be a distance away from zero less than epsilon. In this case, once we passed up all the terms whose original index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, once we passed up all of those terms and we reached the final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, then if we were traveling along the sequence, we would no longer ever see an, a value whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. All of Every forever after, all of these terms after one third will be have an index greater than n. And this concludes part one. So now that we've done some initial investigation, it's not now time to develop some notation so we can communicate the results of that investigation and the conclusions from that investigation to others, and we're better able to clarify to make clear what those conclusions are. So Say that I have a convergence sequence, P1, P2, P3, and so on. And I consider one possible reordering of this convergence sequence. So the way I'm going to notate that reordering is in the following way. So for each term, P sub n, I'm going to, I'm going to um, develop an indexing method. That's an, we're going to have an ordered pair index for each term where we're going to have p sub n comma m, where n, n is the original index, the index in the original sequence, the original index, and m, m is the index in the newly reordered, reordered sequence. So, first step, first step, I'm just going to write out this sequence in its original ordering, but with the new indices. So, for example, for example, I'll have P1, comma, say, 100. And then the second term, P2, is the, the reordering index, the index, the M index, is, say, 3. And the third term is say this in the reordered in the, the index for the reordered sequence is say uh, 552 and so on so this is in the same order as our original sequence but just with our new indexing method and then second the second step to this is then we're going to reorder this according to its m value that is to say we're going to order this in order with respect to the m value so so the three will go somewhere over there, and the three, 552 will go somewhere over there, and the 100 will go somewhere over here, and so on. So it's going to look like something like this. I won't write what the first indices are because I don't know, I don't know what the first index is for, what the original index was for this term whose new index is, say, is, is 1. But re, the reordering according to the M index is going to look like this, where this is whatever the, whatever the original index was, whatever this N term was that was sent to the first first um, index in the reordered sequence. And then we'll have P sub whatever this was, 2. And then, well, we know that the second term in the original sequence was sent to the third term in the reordered sequence. And so on and so forth. Now there's a couple of rules that we have to know just to, to make this to make this um, formal here. We don't want we don't want the same term to go. We don't want two different terms to go to the same index in the newly reordered sequence. So we don't want the first term in this sequence, the first value in the sequence, to also to go to 100, and also the second value in the sequence to go to 100. So that is to say, if there was a function that mapped all the n values, the n indices, to the m indices, then this function is one to one and it's onto. That is to say, every natural number appears somewhere as the second component of this sequence, the second component in our indices. And no, no um, two values in our original, no, no two n values map to the same m value. So there won't be 1 comma 100 and 2 comma 100. This, this will never happen. This will never happen. And this concludes part two.
Okay, so now that we've investigated and we've developed some notation to communicate those investigations, let's solidify and make clear what it is we want to show so that we're better able to make a claim based on our investigations. So say we have a convergence sequence, P1, P2, P3. Then here's what we know. Let's, let's reassure ourselves with what we do know. We know that since this is convergent, then by definition, given, given any epsilon, given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists a positive integer n such that the distance from p n to p, which is the value to which the sequence converges, I forgot to say, this se sequence converges to p, the distance between p n and p is strictly less than epsilon for all n strictly greater than n. So for all terms, p sub n coming after the term p sub capital n, all of those terms, all of those terms have a distance away from the value to which the sequence converges less than epsilon. Okay, so let's use our new notation. Let's play around with our new notation. So we can, we can, we can rewrite this statement saying, given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists a capital N in the positive integers such that D the distance between P sub N comma M and P is strictly less than epsilon for all N strictly greater than N. It's the same statement, but now we're just using our new method of indexing our um, sequence, our, our convergent sequence here. So now, now let's let's solidify and make clear what we want to what we want what we want to show. And I'm not going to say it like that. I'm going to say it with confidence. We will show this. We will show this instead of being in, in, a, in a perpetual state of wanting. So we're going to show the following. We will show. We will show that given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an M, an M in the positive integers, such that the distance between P sub N comma M, little m, and P is strictly less than epsilon for all M strictly greater than M. Just to better make clear our goal here, if we have our sequence where we order it according to the m term. So this is our reordered sequence. So we have p sub something comma 1, p sub something comma 2, p sub something comma 3. This is whatever the original index was in the original sequence before the reordering happened, and so on. Remember, these are our m values, so we want to find some m such that we want to find a capital M in the positive integers. That is, we were given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, we want to find a capital M in the positive integers, such as all terms that ha all terms that occur past P sub something comma capital M, all terms after this term are a distance away from P strictly less than epsilon. Okay, so now we are primed to make a claim based off of our investigations that we did in part one here. So now, let's remind ourselves of what the conclusion of our investigation was. Our conclusion was that all terms in the reordered sequence after the final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, all terms after this term this final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. That is, if we were traveling along this sequence and we reached the final term such whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, then we would forever after, as a traveler, we would never ever encounter a term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. That is to say, all terms after this term, their index in the original sequence was strictly greater than n, and therefore their distance from the value to which the sequence converges is strictly less than epsilon. So check this out. Check this out. Notice what n, the function that n plays in, in this, this definition of convergence. All values after the nth term 
all values after the nth term for a particular epsilon, that is. For our particular epsilon, remember, because n is dependent on epsilon. But all values for some particular epsilon, all values after the nth term have a distance away from the value to which a sequence, a convergent sequence converges, strictly less than epsilon. And this, this, this final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, this plays the same function as the nth term in, in the good old definition of a convergent sequence. So, so, that brings me to the, what we will show, remember, with confidence, we will show that given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, there exists an m in the positive integers such that the distance between p sub n comma m and p is strictly less than epsilon for all m greater than m. So remember this m is plain function as all terms all terms after the mth mth <laughs> mth term have a distance away from p the value to which this sequence converges strictly less than epsilon. So this is a great candidate for m. This is a great candidate, final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n. But how do we talk about the final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n? How do we, how do we, how do we say that? Well, notice, notice, the final term whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, if we were to take the set, if we were to take the set of all terms, p sub n comma m, such that zero is less, excuse me, such that n, n is strictly less than or equal to n, and strictly greater than or equal to one. So that is to say all terms whose index, again, all terms whose index in the original sequence was less than or equal to n, the final term, notice the final term, has the greatest, has the largest index in this newly reordered sequence. That is, it's farthest along in this newly reordered sequence. Another way of saying farthest along farthest along in the sequence, another way of saying that, in fact, of saying it more clearly and formally, is the term whose index out of all of these terms, out of all of these terms, is greatest in the newly reordered sequence. That is to say there, that m index is the largest. So if you consider the set of all m such that m is the index in the newly reordered sequence of a term p sub n comma m, such that n, n, is less than or equal to n, big N, and greater than or equal to one. If we took this set, and we took the maximum of that set, so let's say that this set is S, we'll just call this set S, then if we took the maximum of S, and remember I said that that would be a great candidate, I would that would be a great candidate for M, so if we let ma the max of S equal M, then our claim our claim that we're going to make this remember part four is we're making the claim that we're making a claim that we're going to prove in part five so claim 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 that given any epsilon strictly greater than zero the m that exists is exactly this m that's the maximum of this set s so that's our claim our claim given any epsilon strictly greater than zero this is the m that we're claiming exists based off the existence of n here. So we've made our claim, given any epsilon, or to say this is our m that exists, and I'll say in parentheses, based off of the existence of n, based off of the existence, existence of n, of capital N, and I'll say in another parenthesis, due to the convergence of the original sequence, due to the convergence of the original, of the original sequence. So we've finished, we have made our claim for part four. Okay, so now that we've made our claim, we are now ready to prove our claim. But let's rephrase our claim so that we're better able to prove it. So if we were to rephrase that claim, a, a good way to rephrase that claim is, let me just rephrase it, rephrase it like this. So claim for all m strictly greater than m for this epsilon, for this epsilon, given some epsilon that, that, that is associated with this n value, the epsilon that's associated with this n value in the original, the convergence of the original sequence, 
that for all m is strictly greater than m, the distance between p n comma m and p is strictly less than epsilon. Well, we know that this distance right here, that this distance is strictly less than epsilon if n is strictly greater than n. Because, remember, given any epsilon, there exists an n, and this is the n that exists for the original sequence in its original order, p1, p2, p3, and so on. The sequence in the original order, for any epsilon, there exists an n, and this is in fact that n, such that for all terms coming after the term p sub capital N, all of these terms over here have a distance away from p, the value to which this sequence converges, strictly less than epsilon. So, my claim is, my claim is, that for all m strictly greater than m, that this distance is less than that same epsilon associated with this n value, which is the n value associated with the convergence of the sequence in its original order. But if I can show that if m is strictly greater than m, then that implies that n is strictly greater than n, then, remember, if n is strictly greater than n, then by the convergence of this original sequence, since this n is associated with this particular epsilon, if n is strictly greater than n, then that means that this distance must be strictly less than epsilon. So let's show that this n is strictly greater than n, this, this n right here is strictly greater than capital N, given that m is strictly greater than capital M. So suppose, suppose n is less than or equal to, n is less than or equal to n. So this n is less than or equal to n. And remember, this n is associated with this m. So if n is less than or equal to n, then check this out. That means that this term, that this term p sub n comma m, is in this set. And moreover, moreover, this, this set of all terms, all terms whose original index in the original sequence before the reordering happened, whose original index is less than or equal to n. Moreover, moreover, m is in the set S. But check this out, check this out. This, so, so suppose n is strictly less than or equal to n, so as I said, that implies that m is in S. Remember, because m, this set S, is all terms associated with, all, excuse me, all indices associated with the terms whose original index in the original sequence before the reordering happened, whose original indices were less than or equal to n. So these are all terms, all indices m associated with the terms whose original index in the original sequence before the reordering happened, whose original index was less than or equal to n. So we know, we know now that m is in s if n is less than or equal to n. And if m is in s, then this implies, since m, m is the maximum of s, and if m is the maximum of s, remember the maximum of a set must be greater than or equal to every element in the set. So this implies that m, m is greater than or equal to m. But look at this, by assumption, remember, I'm saying that for all m strictly greater than m. So check this out, this implies that m, since m is strictly greater than m, by assumption, remember, we're taking all m, af all terms p m that come after p big m, all terms to the right of p big m in our newly reordered sequence, aka all indices, all terms indexed by m values, strictly greater than capital M value, the capital P sub capital M, all terms whose indices are strictly greater than capital M. Well, check this out. Since M is strictly greater than M, and remember, I'm trying to show that the distance between all terms to the right of P sub capital M, the distance between that those terms and P is strictly less than epsilon. So I'm taking all terms whose indices are strictly greater than capital M. But if we were to suppose that N is strictly greater, excuse me, if we were to suppose that N is strictly less than or equal to N, capital N, then that implies that M is in S, therefore capital M is greater than or equal to M, since M is the maximum of S, so therefore it's greater than or equal to every element in S. But remember, I just took M to be strictly greater than M. And then I also said that M is greater than or equal to 
little m. So look what look what this this implies. This implies that m is strictly greater than m, and this is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. This is a contradiction. So check this out. Therefore, it must be that n is strictly greater than n, and therefore it must be that for all m strictly greater than m, n is strictly greater than the large n, and therefore this distance between p sub n comma m and p is strictly less than epsilon for all m strictly greater than m. So we can say that given any epsilon strictly greater than zero, because there exists an n such that for all n, for all indices in the original sequence before the reordering happened, for all n strictly greater than n, p sub n and p have a distance strictly less than epsilon. And we know that this n exists. And for that same epsilon, there must also exist, as we've just proven, for all m strictly greater than m, there exists an m, namely the maximum of the set S, of this set S that we've defined down here, all such that all m is strictly greater than m, all terms after p sub something comma m, with our using our notation for indices, all terms after this term in our newly reordered sequence have a distance strictly less than epsilon. So we've proven our statement.